He's the lead, the rodeo master of this one, and he's the reason we're all here today as the founder of this meeting. Um, he is a professor, a Brian Holden professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry. We also have Maria Walker, who you just saw, who is also at the University of Houston. And then we'll have Damian Fisher um, um, logging in remotely from the University of Queensland in Australia. I will let you two get started. All right, thank you. Uh, great to see so many uh, uh, showing up early for the uh, GSLS meeting and joining us in the IFSLR meeting. Uh, an imp impressive group here, actually, and uh, many good friends. And I'm sure there are a few here I need to learn to know better. But thank you for coming. And uh, thank you to uh, our main sponsors, Spouch and Lam and Cooper Vision Blanchard. And uh, without that support, we couldn't do this sort of thing. Uh, but also, I want to thank uh, Square Lens Vision Society, uh, or Square Lens Education Society, uh, <clears throat> who allows us to operate uh, from an uh, administrative point of view. And then uh, we also benefit from uh, the partnership we have with Panther Vision, who uh, invite us uh, at this meeting or at this location. All right, uh, I was uh, disappointed uh, that uh, Tom Fredo could not come because of uh, concerns about the spreading of pandemic. And uh, he's a great uh, optometrist uh, and scientist uh, specialized in anatomy and physiology, and he uh, has an interest in uh, trabecular. But without him here, uh, I'm going to try to pick up the slack, and I have some ideas of my own I'm gonna share with you. Okay, yeah, uh, but I, um, okay, I think I, think I no, let's see. Yeah. I'll say the opposite way, right? okay. Okay, going the opposite direction is natural to me. Uh, all right, uh, uh, that's my financial disclosure. And uh, <clears throat> I'm nothing like uh, Fauci, $10 million investment in industry. <laughs> Recently, uh, Charles McManus in Australia uh, forwarded this uh, concern he had or idea he had uh, that uh, certain functions in the eye. <clears throat> okay, we, we, no, no, wait, can I go? Okay, okay, yeah, not, not a problem. That certain ocular uh, functions uh, can activate a elevation of intraocular pressure and things like lid movement, eye movement, uh, squinting could create a uh, negative pressure that would uh, work on the surface of the eye to elevate intraocular pressure. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he said that this could be a problem for baropathic disease. Baropathic disease is um, uh, when <clears throat> baroreceptors say in the aorta are not functioning, thinner cornea, thinner sclera, and so on. But remember, it's only a hypothesis. Uh, into the scene is uh, my uh, uh, contact lens teacher in London. He said, uh, the, this concern is as old as the lens itself. And you remember that Sclera lens was first fitted like 1886. So he said, not so fast in an English accent, of course. <clears throat> we uh, have a, a good deal of literature out there and uh, this was reviewed by Dr. Maria Walker 
uh, in an excellent review and basically taking a look at that that's about to appear in press. Uh, uh, basically, there is no consensus among articles. Uh, that is, uh, some say, yeah, there is an elevation of pressure. Uh, some say there is none. And part of the problem is uh, to measure the pressure while wearing a lens and how we interpret tonometry. <clears throat> and so we don't really have good instrumentation to measure this pot potential problem. And this is where my uh, research and thinking comes in. If we worry about uh, a lens pressing on the external vessels that collect the channels from canal of slam <clears throat> on the surface. We are only looking at a little bit of the anatomy and physiology when it comes to aqueous outflow. I mean, this is the problem of aqueous outflow that is brought up. I mean, it's not necessarily a problem, but uh, the hypothesis is that uh, we are worried about what happens to the eye if we have pressure on the external uh, vasculature. And <clears throat> question I ask is uh, what, what really happens when a lens settles on these vessels? Has aqueous a different pathway to choose from? an additional pathway. And <clears throat> if you have that, how many do you have? I asked that question at our annual symposium, Cornea and Contact Lens Symposium, now 38th uh, edition actually. I asked the audience, uh, how many do you think we have? How many aqueous outflow pathways do you have? And that was the op options one, two, three, four, and six. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you here so you can calm down. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I can tell you, as you see, 68% uh, got that wrong. And the 30 odd percent that got it right were probably guessing because here we, we're talking about a lot of new information. So if we take a look at what's out there, and, and uh, I went particularly to uh, two sources. One is a great article with over 300 references out of Survey of Ophthalmology, which is one of the highest ranking ophthalmology or eye journals. And then uh, I was not shy. I went to my own book, which is now in 29th edition. We're talking about anatomy and physiology. So let's see what we have there. And, and uh, we can see from this diagram taken from the book that uh, um, collector channels will go basically three different ways, conjunctiva, sclera, and uh, ciliary body. So right there, we have a number of different ways. We're going to take a better look right here. And you see, uh, what is in literature called the conventional outflow. That's what stems from sclera, uh, uh, from a canal of slam. And uh, uh, you can see, as I just mentioned, you have three different ways to go. And if aqueous follow uh, into the scleral venous plexus, most of that is deep in the sclera. A Scleral lens is not going to have an impact on the caliber of those vessels. Cilia body, not a chance. And then you see uh, current literature talks about what we commonly are aware of, the uvious scleral outflow. Uh, but there is also a distinct uh, transscleral outflow. And uh, recent research has indicated that lymphatics get involved. And we're gonna take a quick look at everything. I just try to bring you the idea, the, uh, a concept of what it is we know in uh, anatomy and physiology of the aqueous outflow. Here, I work pretty much exclusively with human tissue. So that's what you see here. And you see here, you have canal of slam, 
and uh, then we have a collector channel heading straight for Conjunctiva. But you can see one is making a sharp turn uh, towards Sclera. It could go further to Cilia body, but you can see that uh, has a lot of stroma between that and the surface. So the Sclera lens is unlikely to clamp that. Here's another uh, sample from human tissue. You see again, uh, canal of slam. And you can see this collector channel spreads out uh, and goes deep in the square towards uh, uvea, I would, would be my guess, because you have uvea that close. That, that's uvea right there, the insertion of the cilio muscle. Other aspects um, or other outflow possibilities is uh, what uh, you, okay, we went. Uh, we have the uvea sclera outflow, which uh, is uh, well known and um, uh, was particularly uh, proven first in monkeys by um, Anders Bell, who you know, like so many other good scientists came from Sweden. And uh, the point there is uh, a, a, a very important concept for you to realize. And that is here you have the angle recess and this is where the uvia scleral outflow starts. In, in high magnification, you can see there's no layer of cells with a chance of promoting uh, or preventing uh, a flow of fluid. So fluid can move any, any direction and the pressure is higher inside the eye. So the flow will be outside. The dubious clear outflow is uh, proven back the uh, Bell's research was back in 66. And, and uh, so there's nothing stopping a flow that way. And we actually treat glaucoma based on that knowledge. It's also important to realize that uh, uh, the sclera that you see here does not have anything like a cellular uh, barrier uh, that can affect the um, uh, fluid movement. Okay. Yeah, it's not advancing. Okay, that, that, okay. Here's an example from a, a human specimen again, and I'm trying to highlight that there you have the scleral spur. Uh, but uh, they have sclera, sclera, and here we have uvea. So, and they have the trabecular meshes. But there is absolutely no layer of cells that could affect fluid movement. So, sclera is not able to stop a fluid movement. Sclera is not uh, waterproof, and therefore given that we have internal pressure uh, that is higher than external, uh, there will be a movement of uh, fluid uh, through that. The um, next one is lymphatic vessels. And uh, uh, there is important that you realize that the lymphatic, function as a drainage network for organs. So that's part of its function to move fluid out. And, uh, and we can see that if we look at uvea here, there is, <clears throat> once it's in the uvea, there is nothing to stop fluid movement out in the square. Just very quickly, <clears throat> uh, uh, Early treatment for glaucoma affected the nervous system and uh, we used drops that affected the nervous system. 
and I dusted off uh, an old publication of mine from 1982, where I outlined that we have a efferent and afferent system in place. And uh, uh, that's what you see there. And, and so we have a nervous system in place to affect the intraocular pressure. And it is possible that uh, we have some adaptation to any changed circumstances. So the bottom line is <clears throat> that uh, Aquas has a lot of different options to go. And we have a nervous system that potentially can adapt to a change in the environment. And uh, <clears throat> also the eye is not a watertight system. Fluid can move in and out and tends to move out. Finally, the um, uh, option you guys, practitioners, if you worry about the intraocular pressure, fit the bigger lens, the lens that lands outside the uh, collector channels. And again, uh, although we're dealing with a hypothesis, uh, keep in mind that uh, we definitely want to see more research. So even though I'm a little uh, leaning towards that the IOP is not affected by square length research, I am all for more research. And with that, I say thank you. All right. Thank you, Jan. So we're going to switch up and talk about a different form of fluid the fluid reservoir, and Maria is going to talk about that. And just a reminder, we're going to have a lively discussion. So be thinking of, of questions and topics that we can discuss when everyone's done speaking. Okay, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So yeah, we're going to switch gears a little bit and now talk a little bit about what anyone who knows me knows is my favorite research subject on scleral lenses, which is the fluid reservoir. So we all are sitting in this room. Most of us have fit a scleral lens on an eye. If not, we are designing scleral lenses to go on the eye. So I don't have to explain this image to most people, but just as a reminder, we're talking about that fluid reservoir in between the scleral lens and, and the cornea. And specifically, the data I'm gonna present is in a paper that's being reviewed called the Lipid and Protein Composition of midday fogging in scleral lenswear. So this is data that we have recently collected. This was actually part of my PhD thesis and it's now being turned into a publication. So the purpose of this study was really twofold. The first was to quantify the lipids and the proteins in the fluid reservoir. And then the second purpose was to really measure midday fogging and compare what we found with the protein and lipid abundances to see if there was any correlation to, to midday fogging. And so this image here, for those of us who maybe don't fit as many lenses, might not be as familiar with what I'm talking about with midday fogging. If you can see this image, you can kind of tell, those of you at home can probably appreciate some kind of speckly debris in the pupil area. These OCT images really drive it home. You can see your front lens. This is image here in B is a patient with midday fogging. So we have that debris that accumulates in the fluid reservoir. Here's just an example of a slit lamp. And then here's a, a sample without midday fogging just for reference for you. So what were the methods? So for this particular study, we recruited 15 normal scleral lens neophytes. So mostly from our student population at UHCO. They wore customized scleral lenses for four days. After each day, we took an uh, anterior segment OCT to quantify the midday fogging. We also collected the fluid reservoir from underneath the lens. And then we used mass spectrometry to, at the University of Florida to actually determine lipid protein abundances. You can see, and we did a, uh, we had an ImageJ protocol, which is a, a free imaging analysis software through the NIH. 
you can see here's an example of what some of our scores were. This patient on top, pretty low score. You don't see much midday fogging in that reservoir versus somebody who's got a score of 90 where you see a lot of opacification in that fluid reservoir. So we tested this method. We basically determined the repeatability and reliability of that method of measurement. So that's uh, how we measured midday fogging. And like I said, the mass spec or MS is what we use for lipid protein abundances. For those that are interested, which may or may not be uh, many of, in, of you in this room, just a very quick review of what mass spectrometry actually is. Essentially, you have a sample and it goes in through a bunch of tubing. The sample is, is uh, uh, ionized or vaporized rather um, and ionized. So they put a charge to it. It basically shoots through this machine the, the, the machine detects the mass and the charge, mass to charge ratio, and it basically compares it to a database. Um, and so you can tell, it's a good way of, if you don't know anything that's in a sample to get an idea of kind of everything in the sample, but the abundances are relative to each other. So it's, it's what we consider partially quantitative. So looking at the results, this is just the general, we had subjects, there was some females, they wore their lenses for about eight hours every day. Uh, the scleral lenses were well within the fitting parameters that I'm sure most of you are using. Um, so this is just the, the data on the scleral lens parameters. Here you can see, I left this up in case anyone has any questions, it's a little bit messy, but basically what this data showed us, if you look at this last column here, these are all these different factors in the first column and their correlation to midday fogging is in that final column. So if you look at the p-values in parentheses, we did not see any significant correlations between any of these fitting outcomes and the midday fogging in this limited population. But in this population, we did not see any uh, differences. If you look, I'll draw your attention here is the one that might shock a little few of you, this apical clearance. You see you have a trend towards a little bit higher clearance in midday fogging. Most of us know that clinically that's, that tends to be the case, but didn't reach significance in this, uh, in this cohort. So again, looking at, we, we ended up having 13 subjects who had eligible data. We only analyzed 12 of the fluid reservoirs. One of the patients settled so much that we couldn't collect any of the fluid. We first grouped them for the mass spec analysis into midday foggers and non-midday foggers. Um, but you can also see once we did the quantification, our range was uh, seven to 96. Uh, and so we ended up using it as a continuous variable. So, which basically means it's, it's more statistically sound to be able to compare numbers than it is groups to a certain outcome. So what did we find? So lipids was where it was the most interesting. And so there was over a thousand distinct lipid species detected in these samples. And you can see the major, major categories. So the way that lipids are typically talked about is in these categories, and there's eight major categories of lipids in biology. We've only shown the ones that were the most abundant here um, and that are more biologic. And then there's these relevant classes here which is where you see the triglycerols is probably the one, the tags probably most of us are more familiar with. That's a, a class. And then within those classes, there's many different species. So lots and lots of lipids found. The ones that we'll talk about are sterols and fatty acids because those are the most interesting. And you can look, like I said, we grouped groups in midday fogging and non-midday fogging initially. So if you look at the major types of lipids seen in the midday fogging group versus the non-midday fogging group, you can see it looks pretty similar. But if you take a little closer look at our fatty acid group, you can see they make up about 8%, 7% more of the lipids in the midday fogging samples than they do in the non-midday fogging samples. So that's what we'll take a, a closer look at in a moment. First, I'll just mention the sterols. So sterols, the ones you're, so these are your steroids, right? And the steroids are part of the sterol group. We're probably most familiar with the cholesterol ester group. You maybe have heard it. It's one of the most abundant lipids that's produced by meibomian glands. So in, a different, in different patients, they might make up 40 to 80% of all the lipids on the surface of the eye. So cholesterol esters, is an important one and we call it CE2. So you can see that our saturated cholesterol esters showed 
somewhat of a positive correlation to increasing midday fogging. Uh, but none of our other groups of, of sterols really showed a relationship. So the ones that we kind of looked at are, are the saturated cholesterol esters. And if you look here, and I'm happy to share these slides with people who are interested, because um, I know we're, we're going a little bit quick for these. But um, so you can see the saturated cholesterol esters were higher, but they only made up about 1% of the total lipids. So probably not hugely contributory towards midday fogging. Where we really saw the difference, again, was in this fatty acyl group, specifically in our wax esters and our fatty amides. So wax esters, you can think of them as kind of the teammate with the cholesterol esters. Between the two of them, wax esters and cholesterol esters, they're going to make up 80 to even 90% of the lipids in most people's tear foam. And this is just a normal tear foam, nothing to do with scleral lenses. So what we know about wax esters and cholesterol esters is they're highly abundant in the natural tear film. The other thing that they are is primarily responsible for reducing evaporation of the tear film, which means that they tend to be hydrophobic. That is, they will precipitate out like oil and water if you have an aqueous solution. So keep that in mind. It obviously is, is meaningful with, with midday fogging. Again, so we found many unsaturated wax esters, and there was 11% of the total lipids. And you can see, you might not be able to see, you'll just have to trust me, all of those are significant. Uh, most of the p-values are less than 0 0.01. So the, if you see like a plus 0.78, that's like a one-to-one -one direct relationship. So as these wax esters increase in the fluid reservoir, we see midday fogging scores go up in these patients. I just will mention proteins to mention that we looked at them. We found about 1,500. None of them showed a positive correlation to increase midday fogging. These are the biggest proteins. This is just a table from the paper. Uh, these are the 14 most abundantly detected uh, proteins. You can see one of them, this is an IgG chain, is actually negatively correlated. But I, I won't get into that in this, in this setting. Anybody can chat with me about it after. We don't really know what that means. So, uh, but but it's, it's part of the data set, so I wanted to share it. So really the conclusions of this data at this point are that nonpolar lipids. So when we say nonpolar polar versus polar, nonpolar are the ones that are hydrophobic. Polar are the ones that are hydrophilic. And actually the polar lipids in the tear film, which we didn't talk about here, but as an aside, help those nonpolar particle or lipids interact with the aqueous, with the aqueous, or, or yeah, aqueous tear. So nonpolar lipids appear to be contributory to midday fogging in scleral lens wear. No correlations between any of the scleral lens fitting characteristics with midday fogging, and large proteins do not appear to contribute. Now there's a few limitations as they're all with all studies. We had a small sample size, although I'll tell you, we did do what we call post hoc sample size analysis to determine what the power of the study is. Any of you researchers probably know the benchmark of power of about 80% power. This means that a study is designed well enough to, to be believable. <laughs> um, so we were powered at about 78% with the wax ester. So I think that's again, the most important takeaway from this data. I'll also mention just briefly that small proteins like your cytokines, so like MMP9 or proteases like MMP9, but also cytokines like interleukins that you may have heard of, those weren't detectable in this, right? You have this like bandwidth that mass spec will detect and we kind of kept it in the large proteins for this one. So we wouldn't have detected if MMP9 was different, for example. So we didn't look at that to be, to be clear in this study. And then there's probably different variations of midday fogging, which if people are interested, we can always talk about in the, in the discussion, discussion section, but certainly you clinicians know, you look at patients who have this midday fogging, it looks, sometimes it looks a little fluffier, sometimes it looks a little bit more um, like larger pieces of debris. Um, and then, so the next steps again are to help categorize that midday fogging appearance and see if in different patients, it's different things. Uh, and to look in a little larger group and, and at a more targeted uh, kind of why, uh, more targeted approach into these lipids and 
uh, proteins. Now, this last slide here is probably my favorite slide because these are some images. So to summarize this work, but also some previous stuff that we've done in the lab, right? So we have midday fogging on top and the tear film. So to summarize what I think is going on in this midday fogging, here's our lipids. This is a, actually back when I was, shout out to Randy Kojima in the back. This was a Pacific University photo that was taken years ago. Found, this is positive staining for lipids here. And then also, this is another study we've done looking at, these are epithelial cells and neutrophils. So what's in midday fogging? Definitely lipids, definitely cells. What combination of which and which patients is still um, to be determined? You can see our non-midday fogging examples. They don't have very much stuff in there. So, you know, just in, in terms of a possible discussion topic, if we want to get to this, what do we actually do about this? What does this mean uh, to us clinically? And with that, I am going to thank you guys for your attention. Now, I'm, this is the first switch to a virtual presenter. So while you and introduce... I will, I will let you do your thing. And thank you for reminding me of everything I forgot about in biochemistry, Maria. Appreciate it. Um, so to quote A. Vanderwerf, we are flying down to Australia right now. So buckle your seatbelts. Um, Dr. Dr. Damien Fisher will be um, presenting on the conjunctiva um, while Maria links him. Damien, you should have it if you want to try sharing. Yep, can everybody hear and see me? Is the sound coming through okay, Maria? Yeah, you're good. All right. Greetings, everyone from Australia. Many thanks to Maria and Jan for the invitation to speak. I'll be discussing uh, a paper that we've published recently, which looks at the incidence of conjunctival prolapse during open eye scleral lens wear and its association to certain fitting parameters. Um, this paper was a bit of a result from during the data collection in my PhD, which you will hear a bit more about on uh, Sunday during the scleral super session. Uh, for those that have fitted scleral lenses, we have more than likely seen conjunctival prolapse. Um, but just for those that, that are not too familiar, just a bit of a brief explanation. So it refers to the drawing up of conjunctival tissue beneath the peripheral region of the scleral lens, which you can see in the OCT image captured above. It's been called many names um, and some various things it's been referred to as conjunctival folds, hoarding, chalasis, inlaps and tenting. It's thought to arise from the, the pressure or fluid forces that are generated behind a sealed scleral lens. And it tends to occur in locations where excessive limbal fluid reservoir thickness is noted. In the short term, it does not seem to adversely affect corneal function or scleral lens performance, but the long-term effects are still largely unknown. The study design is basically what I use in the PhD. Um, the spectralis OCT was used to capture images and participants wore their scleral lenses for 90 minutes in an open eye session. Uh, peripheral images were taken with the participant fixating an external target at 26.5 degrees at nasal and temporally. Uh, I had 10 participants ranging from the age of 24 to 37 who had no ocular pathology, good visual acuity and no contraindications to contact lens wear. Uh, the ICD scleral lens was used with a 16 and a half mil diameter with a high decay of 141. With this study, I had three sort of target groups of varying central fluid reservoir thickness um, with the low categorized as 150 microns, medium with 500 and the high at 750. Uh, the identification of the prolapse was done by visual inspection of the final OCT images. An example here is on the top. Um, and the images were segmented and measured to, to look at the peak elevation of the prolapse and an area of maximum tissue compression. So if we're looking at the image, uh, image A, the red line is the posterior lens surface 
purple line is the anterior epithelial boundary and the blue line is the posterior endothelial surface. Uh, the peak of the prolapse was noted and its position relative to the scleral per spur was measured along with the, the peak compression. And then this was then matched using the scleral spur as a landmark in the initial image to compare both the pre and post measurements. Uh, limbal fluid reservoir thickness was also measured at the scleral spur, which would have been at about this region here. Analysis was done by using chi-square analysis for proportions and was used to examine the association between conjunctival prolapse with fluid reservoir thickness and location. Repeated measure anovers were used to examine the effect of condition, location, and their interaction upon the initial and final limbal fluid reservoir thickness, the extent of lens settling and the magnitude of tissue compression. A series of unpaired t-tests were used to compare the, the initial and final fluid reservoir thicknesses, the extent of lens settling and the magnitude of tissue compression between the eyes with and without the conjunctival prolapse. So the results are as follows. So across the entire study, prolapse was observed in 37% of the measures. 80% of the participants, that was eight of the 10, showed prolapse at least once. Uh, the prolapse was observed more frequently nasally at 73% and temporally at 27%, and it was shown to be statistically significant. For the low fluorescein thickness, uh, sorry, the low FR group, the fluid reservoir thickness, uh, that was with 150 microns, they showed a greater initial limbal fluid reservoir thickness and more settling. Greater limbal settling was associated with those of that had larger or higher elevations of prolapse, but wasn't associated with the landing zone compression or the initial and final limbal reservoir thickness. In summary, the prolapse was observed quite commonly, um, but this was within open eye scleral lens wear with rotationally symmetrical landing zones in a healthy eye. The peak elevations were associated with the extent of limbal settling but not necessarily with the amount of compression or the fluid reservoir asymmetry. Within the low central fluid reservoir thickness, um, it shows what, what I've seen referred to as thin film adhesion that tends to result in some suction of the, the scleral lens and the, um, the, the surface of the eye. However, more work is needed. This is only an initial study but it was aimed to, to shed some light on the incidence of, of the reservoir. But clinically, it's usually anecdotally observed to be more in the, the inferior region, and certainly other quadrants would be worth looking at to be examined in future studies. So uh, I'll leave it at that. That's just a brief and quick rundown, uh, and I'll hand it back over to Maria now. Thank you, Damien. Um, so we have a bit of time to do some discussion. I want to open up to, to the floor for questions. Um, don't be shy. Um, we have runners, Greg, I see, saw your hand first and Justine, I see you next. So you're up. Um, we've got someone coming around for a microphone or if you can speak really loudly, you can do it that way. Okay. Yeah, I have to be on the mic. One okay. other thing for those of you at home. If you do have your, if you do want to come on your video, you can just note we can all see you. So make sure you're <laughs> appropriately. Yeah, and for those of you um, that are on Zoom, we would love to hear from you as well. Um, if you would like to speak, please unmute yourself, but don't say anything until one of us kind of invites you to, to talk and please keep yourself muted otherwise. Maria, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, thank you for your research. I think midday fogging is probably one of the big, biggest headaches that as a practitioner, the practitioner that we face, uh, usually on a weekly basis. And well, I know your study a little bit. You you were fitting just standard contact or scleral lenses, standard design lenses. Is that correct? Yeah. So they were the Europa lens, but they were designed, you know, but they were just toric. They didn't even have quad specific. It wasn't impression based. You know, it's interesting because one thing that I've noticed more frequently in the last year or so is that when fitting more freeform type lenses, sometimes we can get those lenses that are a little bit loose 
and have some movement, especially initially. And almost with 100% certainty, not, not all the time, but almost 100%, when you have a lens that moves, that continues to move, it's move and won't settle, you really get a lot of midday fogging. So it'd be interesting to maybe in, in your future uh, research to do something with more freeform designs. You would think with a more freeform design that you would get better alignment, maybe you know, have, have a lens that better adheres to the eye and have less midday fogging. But I think that sometimes it's actually the opposite. Yeah, I, I'm gonna let Chris go. So Justine had a question before Chris. Are you sure? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just two seconds. You know, jumping on what you said there, it would be really interesting to take some of these designs where you can specifically make specific changes on the lens in a certain part of the lens without changing the overall fit. Uh, for example, just changing limbal point or changing the periphery, making it looser, making it tighter with a specific design. I think, you know, any of these designs that are, are based off a model would work and, and then and then seeing what actually correlates in the design. You know, if we made more limbal clearance versus less limbal clearance. One of the things I find is, is, is um, when midday foggy, if we lower that limbal clearance down, we actually get less midday fogging. Uh, but that could be done in a controlled study in a controlled manner. Well, I should say too that once we, if we have a lens that's loose and we tighten it up, that almost always cures the midday fogging for that particular patient. Yeah, and I think just, you know, I think you're, you're both kind of alluding to one of the things that we've kind of realized, which it's probably different causes for different people, right? So you've got the meibomian gland issue, which I think certainly tightening it up, reducing the amount of lipids from the meibomian glands that can kind of get in there after the lens is on and settled. Um, but then the other thing is these cells, right? And the cells are coming from two places. One is just sloughing off the epithelium. So you know, that's why some, maybe some of our patients that eye wash works and some of it, it doesn't work. We know right in the morning, maybe they've got more cells. The other thing is when you put any amount of pressure on a blood vessel, conjunctival blood vessels, you're typically going to get some increased vascular permeability of those blood vessels. You'll almost always get mass cell re release, neutrophil release, right? That's the the paper from a few years ago found some, you know, neutrophils. We've found neutrophils in the in the fluid reservoir. So blood vessels, corneal epithelium, meibomian glands. There's a lot of different places they can come from. So maybe the the fit for one versus the other might be a different a different solution. But yeah, I think Karen cares. Even oh, let's let Justine go. <laughs> okay, uh, Maria, I actually just had a quick question for you about the lipid study. So you know, we're talking about midday fogging which you know, in my clinical practice has been more significant in older patients that have poor TO film. Do you feel like there's a lot of limitation of using students, uh, young students probably, uh, you know, as comparison to you know, older individuals that, that do start to have you know, dry eye issues? Do you think that composition is gonna change when you expand that study? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's good and bad to use students. One, they're an incredibly controlled group. Um, so, but they give us the pilot data that we need to design the study in a more disease specific population. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that there was tended to be a relationship of, and I won't go too much into it, a relationship of saturated to unsaturated lipids. Um, in the ratio in the midday fogging was very similar to what some of our dry eye colleagues are finding is meibomian gland alterations in lipids in dry eye patients in older patients, right? And I think every person here would say your older dry eye patient tends to be at higher risk for midday fogging. And so I would hypothesize that they might have that same saturated to unsaturated kind of poor meibomian gland uh, secretions that could be contributing to it. So Maria, great work. Um, so my question is actually the leading up from that. Um, was um, ruling out MGD part of your exclusion criteria uh, when you've recruited your patients? Yeah, no, because we didn't know this then. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so it wasn't, but I would say, um, you know, they don't, ha I can't think of a single one of them that would have had clinically diagnosable MGD. Um, you know, as, as again, you all know, it's, it's not something we typically see in 20 to 25 year olds. Um, but that's, yeah, again, a lot, lot of things we got to control for in the, in the future studies. 
come up, get a mic. Yeah, I was going to say. I want to take an opportunity to um, introduce Gloria Chu, who is our um, discussant, a clinical faculty discussant, who's at the University of uh, Southern California. And also she has published on a lot of these topics in IOP. So I definitely want to pick your brain on a couple things, but we'll let Lynette talk first. And I'll say probably maybe last question for, for Fluid yeah. Reservoir, then we can chat a little bit with Gloria. So I have two questions, one for you, Maria, and one for Damien. So I'll start with you, Maria. Um, you had about 70% female? Yeah. This, okay. So my question is, were they not wearing any makeup that day of the testing? That is a good question. And I, that, again, we didn't control for that. Um, again, I can tell you, I don't remember. I mean, we have videos <laughs> of them. That's interesting. I can mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, that would be interesting to go through because we have got videos. So we'd be able to look you and see, see what's going on. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, that, we did not. So. And my other question is for Damien. Do you think that um, maybe having oval optic zones might change the... Um, propensity of patients having prolapse, where it'd be shorter in the vertical meridian? That's yeah, it. for sure. Um, altering the, the fitting, characteristic, fitting characteristics to, to account for the, the asymmetries in the landing zone, I think would definitely make a difference. Um, scientifically, it's just a bit of a trickier thing to do sometimes, but it'd be a matter of working out the right protocol and the right fitting characteristic to sort of examine that. But but yes, I think it would, would certainly make a difference in influencing either that or, or landing zone asymmetry as well. Um, so first question and then come in. Uh, what was the diameter of the lens that you used for this? Yeah. Am I? Marie. Um, it was designed based on the subject's eyes. And, and so it was designed so that we'd have the same amount of basically overlap past the limbus, but it was ranged from 15 and a half to 16.4 millimeters in diameter. Yes. So uh, in my opinion, that is the cause because all your test subjects are young students and it is surprising to see midday fogging for that kind of patients. The cause that I feel is the lens is not stable. It is moving even if there is a slight movement, since you said it's a you know small diameter lenses, there is a high chance of lens moving up and down. And that may irritate and produce all kind of, you know, cytokines and all these things that you saw. Yeah, I appreciate the comment. Um, I, I would tend to disagree on the movement aspects because, you know, remember, these were fit first, right? So they came in for several fitting visits. They And I don't, again, I don't have the data in front of me. I don't typically consider a moving lens a pretty good fit. So I probably wouldn't have... But I, I do I do appreciate that that perspective, and I, I do definitely agree with Greg and and uh, what you're saying about a moving lens causing midday fogging. Um, I'll tell you, I you know, and we, I work with a lot of students. They have midday fogging with well fitted lenses. It still hits about 25, 30 percent, and maybe you've got some secret sauce you're using that I need to learn about. But I still see it pretty consistently, 25 percent of people. Since it's a study, maybe you can use the same patients and try and put at least two millimeter larger lens and see if there is a midday fogging. There you go. Just Come join my study team. I need you. Uh, I just want to be fair to the other speakers and let's switch topics to the IOP. If anyone has questions on that, we'll come back. Do you have a question about IOP? John, I saw your, your hand raised, but to, to be fair. Well, as far as... Two, sorry. sorry, just one sec to Karen's point. We have that half an hour at the end, you guys, where it's like open session. So if you do have any other questions, write them down so you don't forget them. We can yeah, so we'll move that. on to IOP right now. So uh, as far as the IOP, uh, very nice presentation, Professor. Uh, have you considered the temperature difference uh, causing the change in the IOP? Because in normal eye condition, the cornea is two degree lesser than the body temperature. And that is a convection you know, channel that also initiates the aqueous movement. The moment you put a scleral lens on, there is uh, you know, a little bit warmer situation and that aqueous channel does not work that efficiently and that can you know, lead to raise in the IOP. 
any comments or any thoughts on that? Um, well, just to help repeat his, his questions, I think what you were saying is the, the, you know, the temperature and the convection currents theoretically are going to change when you put a, a scleral lens on the eye. So you think that that could have any impact on, on IOP or? Uh, <clears throat> this is on. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, uh, flow of uh, aqueous in the anterior chamber is uh, dictated by temperature. Uh, I haven't given it much thought that that would have um, an effect on, on, on an eye wearing a square lens. We could consider it, but I, I would think it would not have a lot. But we need to think about a lot of things. I mean, we have six different ways for aqueous to escape from the eye. And, and um, I, th I, I, I think that there is enough slack in the system. So if we have increased uh, resistance in some areas, uh, the slack can be picked up elsewhere. And there is literature on that. I couldn't get into that uh, in my presentation, but uh, we should be aware of that uh, with the UV is clear outflow, there is no uh, number that has been established that so much will go that way, the UV is clear way. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that we don't know how much goes because it does vary and it varies according to conditions and this is what we play with when we treat glaucoma uh, with uh, prostaglandin so so uh, yeah basically what I try to do here is just make you aware of there's a lot of different ways uh, aqueous can go and don't forget uh, sclera is not waterproof and <clears throat> there is a constant leak and since the pressure is higher in the eye or there's no amplification there. yeah the pressure is higher inside the eye uh, then the flow will go out and help um, keep the pressure low anyway uh -huh. not really an answer to your question but all right, well, thank you. So I definitely wanna hear from you, Gloria. So Gloria, for those of you that don't know, Gloria did a study with her real patients at SC, uh, S, S, USC. Uh, anyways, I'll let you, what are your thoughts and opinions on this stuff? So very interesting topics this morning so far. And for everyone, if you do have an interest in IOP and scleral lens, where I wanted to mention that Muriel Shornack, Stephen Vincent, and Maria Walker published an excellent review that was published in Contact Lens and Interior Eye just a couple months ago. And it really reviews everything from, um, you know, outflow of aqueous fluid, um, proposed mechanisms of how IOP can be elevated, as well as a really good summary of all the studies that have been done so far looking at um, short-term scleral lens wear, long-term scleral lens wear, as well as effects on optic nerve head morphology and various um, clinical structures. So wanted to throw that out there so that you can read it on your flight home or travel home. Um, so as a clinician who has the opportunity to dabble in some research, at USC. You know, I have a lot of thoughts about this topic. We all collectively have been fitting more and more scleral lenses over the last 10 to 20 years. I have seen very few uh, case reports or case series about glaucoma development due to elevated IOP in our scleral lens wearers. Maybe it's because we're not routinely checking IOP. Are we all checking IOP during follow-ups of our scleral lens patients and during fittings? And also, if we did actually find slightly elevated IOP, a couple millimeters of mercury, is this going to affect the way we practice in our keratoconic patients, in our GVHD Sjogren's patients who rely on scleral lens wear for 
um, their livelihood for a quality of vision and quality of life. So kind of just some food for thought. I wonder, you know, if we did find elevated IOP, would you discontinue lenswear? Would you put them in an RGP instead, even if they couldn't tolerate it? How will this impact our clinical practice? So that's kind of one question I have. We focus so much on studying, okay, is there a 1% increase, a 3% increase? If there was, maybe we can start them on IOP lowering drops, um, but would you actually discontinue or how will this, these, these findings you know, affect the way we practice? Um, there was a study recently published out of Wilmer Eye Institute that supported elevated IOP in well-controlled well well um, glaucoma patients at nighttime between 4 to 7 a.m. So are you going to not let your patients go to sleep? You know, it's, it's interesting how we're looking so much at short-term or fluctuations, but really we want to know long-term how do we need to change our care to better help our patients? So what do people think about that? You want this one? There you go. I wanna make sure that we get our folks that are coming in from other areas of the country. Um, Afe asked a question and I, Ave, can you unmute yourself by chance and ask your question? There he is. I can. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, there he yeah. is. There he is. Live hey, from the Netherlands, everyone. I know. Flying around the world, Karen. Yep. As you said. Yeah, now, I was just listening to your great talks, uh, Damien, Maria, and I was just thinking about that phenomenon, or both of them, and could it be that the, uh, well, the physical um, mechanism behind that uh, could be to some degree be the same, that there is that influx of either, well, debris or, or lipids, as, as Maria explained it, and or conjunctiva tissue? Is, is, could that be that pressure inwards? Uh, could that be, because it seems like to some degree, the solutions with aligning the lens and everything are, are the same. Is there a link or um, am I just drinking too much wine here all by myself in Amsterdam? Uh, I'll certainly let Damien uh, kind of respond if he wants to. I would say um, that there's not enough evidence to support it one way or the other. You're not, I don't think you're thinking off, is off. I think that's actually fascinating uh, that you made that connection. Um, but given, I think what the current, so put it this way, midday fogging has never been evaluated in any sort of negative pressure suction physics way. So it's, you know, of course it makes sense if you have this subatmospheric pressure underneath the lens, it sucks stuff in, you've got debris, it, it sucks it in, conjunctival tissue. Uh, maybe that conjunctival tissue adds, um, to, to the, the midday fogging, I'll tell you, I don't see that. It's not like you see conch prolapse and you see midday fogging in every patient. So uh, what's your thoughts, Damien? And then I think Andrew Pucker here in our audience will make a comment and maybe that might be the last yeah. one, we'll see. Yeah, uh, from clinician to clinician, I think possibly there'd be a relationship, but um, I think as Maria has already said, midday fogging seems to be a has a broad spectrum and there, there, it, it may be a multifactorial thing that leads to the occurrence. So whether it's some sort of inflammatory issue caused by prolapsing, it, it's hard to say for sure, but definitely it's something I think should be considered um, and, and looked at in future studies, but it, it, it's a hard thing to, to tease out, I would think, scientifically. I think this kind of pulls together all three talks, like where is this midday fogging stuff coming from? Is it from prolapse? Is it from outflow from the sclera? It's really hard to say. And I've thought a lot about this. I helped with Cameron Postikoff's scleral lens fogging project a couple of years ago. And we found that uh, corneal clearance had a relationship with fogging and then it was close to, to um, an association with white blood cells. But where is all that coming from? And I don't really know how you could ever parse that out specifically. I think it's multifactorial. It's probably all of those things we've talked about. And I don't know how you could do them in isolation because these lipids come from all these different parts of the eye or the proteins come from different places or it could be from debris like makeup. And in, if you want to 
try to exclude makeup stuff, you probably just have to have makeup free people because makeup is on your eye for like a week. And um, it's, it's a great question, but even trying to do like a transgenic mouse with labeling, I don't even know if that could really get to it, um, but maybe. You could do my Vomian gland knockout and, and knock out there with I, I'm joking. Yeah, but like, <laughs> Yeah, that'd be cool, but then yeah. there's the same lipids produced from right. cells sloughing off, so complex. I have one more comment about midday fogging. So we're focusing a lot on how to change the fit, diameter, or movement to limit midday fogging, but you know, your study, Maria, has shown that you've detected a lot of proteins and lipids that could be caused by, you know, inflammation. Maybe even in these young, healthy individuals, there can still be lid margin inflammation. And I wonder if we need to sometimes turn our focus on how to control lid margin inflammation, potentially with now, you know, IPL um, that has an anti-inflammatory effect that works against, you know, suppressing um, MMP interleukins. Is that something that may help to reduce midday fogging? So instead of talking about just minimizing influx into the reservoir, can we just stop production of this? So again, just some more food for thought. I know we have to move on to the yeah. next topic. So yeah, I, I know that's great. And I'll, I'll maybe make the last comment. And, and I think, um, you know, just to comment on yours, Gloria, I, if you were to ask me where I see this whole midday fogging going, it would be in two ways. One, recognizing it's a patient specific, not a fit specific. And I would see a day where somebody has midday fogging and you say, okay, here's your therapeutic, your whatever insert anti-inflammatory drug. Maybe it's not made yet, right? Something that, that helps this and hope, you know, we may need to use something therapeutic for it. So I'll leave it All right. That. Thank you, everyone. We're going to take, we want to keep on time and we're going to start the next session at, at uh, 45 past the hour. Um, but you're welcome to take a quick break. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers and to Gloria. And thank you, everyone who is coming in from not, uh, not in the room for, pay, for your questions. So for those of you on Zoom, that's about seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs>